Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, Professor of History at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Economic sanctions have long been an important diplomatic tool when states hope to compel or deter while avoiding direct military confrontation, the recent U.S.-led sanctions regime against Russia during the Ukraine war being but the most recent example. Yet economic sanctions can be a difficult tool to manage. Knowing how quickly or intensely to ramp them up, or knowing when or how to signal what must be done to get them removed are both challenging questions. At both the start and the finish of sanctions, there are complex issues of holding together coalitions to impose them, and how to deal with the reality that sanctions can hurt innocent citizens of rogue regimes more than the leadership. And of course, there is always the possibility that sanctions can provoke the very armed conflicts they were intended to avoid. Recognizing this range of strategic questions, we at A Better Peace are delighted to welcome Professor Mark E. Duckenfield to discuss sanctions in both theory and practice. Professor Mark Duckenfeld is Professor of International Economics in the Department of National Security and Strategy and at the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College. The former chair of the Department of National Security and Strategy, he holds an MA and PhD in political science from Harvard University, where he specialized in European political economy. He has written numerous academic articles on gold, financial crises, and international political economy, and is the author of the book, Business and the Euro. Welcome to A Better Peace, Dr. Duckenfeld. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be with you. So let's start on the, with the most basic question. Do economic sanctions work? And what does it mean to say they work? Well, that was, that was going to be my first response. <laughs> what do you mean by work? Um, in the same way that you say, well, does, does bombing cities with air power work? Does, you know, presumably what you want is to get someone to change their policy. And in that regard, sometimes the answer is with many things is sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, and sanctions can often be one part of a wider array of tools that countries are using, you know, diplomatic, uh, military, whether coercive or not, and of course, informational to try and uh, 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 compel or coerce a um, adversary to stop doing what they have been doing or to affirmatively do something that you would desire them to do. Right. So what do you, when, when you think about economic sanctions and you think about examples of them, what's, a, what's an example of a successful application of economic sanctions? Well, probably the most famous successful application was the American and allied sanctions uh, and threatened sanctions against Britain and France during the Suez crisis in 1956. So uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Nasser had taken over the Suez Canal, which was then the largest corporation in the world. Um, it was an Arab nationalist. This was threatening British and French interests. And he also had disputes with Israel. And Britain and France conspired with Israel to stage an attack on, on Egypt. And uh, the United States and many other countries, most other countries, saw this as the return of gunboat diplomacy, the sort of great power politics that they thought had been should have been left behind. And the U.S. threatened oil sanctions. They um, um, started uh, interfering with British and French abilities to get loans. And the British and French, though militarily successful, um, ended up caving very quickly. Now, their economies were quite interdependent with that of the United States, Western Europe, and others. And keep in mind, at the same time, even, even some other members of the you know, NATO alliance were suggesting maybe we should expel France and Britain from NATO. This was seen as you know, such a breach. So it 
carried a whole wave of activity. But the sanctions, especially the American sanctions, were seen as being a very crucial element of that um, turnaround. Well, you mentioned two aspects of the Suez crisis that uh, that struck me. One is that we're talking about economies that were already deeply connected to the United States. So obviously, the United States has leverage. The United States could drive down the value of the pound sterling, for example. But at the same time, you were also talking about two democratic states. So public opinion mattered too. So when it, you know, just the simple, the notion that they were being sanctioned sort of worked to, to pressure the governments. Do sanctions work better on democracies than they do on dictatorships? We often tend to think of sanctions through a sort of simplified model of democracy and are the sort of economic policy and economic politics that convey our normal elections. And if the economy goes down, the incumbent party suffers. So if you put sanctions on some democratic government and their economy goes down, people will blame the government. They'll be more likely to vote them out. And so the government will try and do what it can to bring its policies into alignment with the, with the sanctioning country. That's the simple theory. Now, with an authoritarian government, it becomes rather more complicated. They don't depend upon popular support for staying in power. Their mechanisms are different. Um, and in fact, they frequently have a wide array of informational controls. So any hardship their people suffer can very clearly be steered towards the external power, trying to do things that, you know, they're, they're, they're Russia phobes or they don't like Cuba or, or whatever, whoever your, your country is, you can make them to be the uh, villain of the piece. And you're the one protecting your citizenry because things would be even worse if you did what these um, other people wanted you to do. Right. That would be the argument. And is it is it fair to say too that if I'm a dictatorship, if I'm running a dictatorship, what I what I fear most is a popular uprising. So things would have to get pretty bad for there to be a popular uprising and I I may push back even harder. Uh, if I realize that my only choice is, it's not like I'm just going to be voted out of office, but I'm either going to be run out of town on a rail or stay in power, um, I'm I'm likely to, to hang on as long as possible. That's right. You're going to want to hang on as long as possible. Now, increasingly, we've taken to be using, especially against authoritarian governments, targeted sanctions because we recognize our intelligence services, our politicians, that the decision-making apparatus isn't in the control of the population. It's in control of some array of elites. It's not always clear to us how those work. They're often not very transparent, given the nature of the regime. But if we can find powerful people and start making their life difficult, then maybe they could use their influence to either convince the decision-makers or to overthrow the decision makers, so it's a simple, it's a it's a simplified authoritarian version, which is a more complicated form of of sanctioning. But there still might well be reasons why you would have much broader based um, sanctions as well that hit the population, even when we think of them as, especially in an authoritarian government, as relatively innocent for the crimes of their uh, leaders. Right now, uh, in American public opinion, or certainly in American politics, there's been a lot of talk that sanctions were successful, say, in bringing Iran to the table to create the Iran nuclear deal, right? whatever one thinks about that deal. Um, does that count, you think, as an example of successful sanctions? And what made them successful? Oh, I think they, they were successful. And again, you can agree or disagree with whether the deal that was negotiated was a good one or we got, you know, snookered or, or what have you. But I think it seems very clear that getting the major powers on board, the Europeans, the Russians, ourselves on board, um, sanctioning the Iranians at a very extreme level, concentrated their mind and raised the costs of their nuclear program. It particularly also uh, largely cut them off from international oil market. So it made them much more um, pliable mm -hmm. in terms of getting to the policies we want. But it does highlight that it can often, especially bigger country, they, they can, you know, there's a lot of ruin in a country. And if they're really intent on something, um, they can often pursue it regardless of what the costs are. But this can change some of the calculus and some of the calculus that we were providing, including, a you know, a, a, a unfreezing some of the Iranian assets that were frozen in 1979 uh, go back to 
very long-standing and important uh, differences. So yes, I think that would be an example of a, of a successful uh, set of san- uh, successful result for a sanction. Yeah. Right. Although, and and uh, I want to move on, move to the current events in a minute. But just the, one of the one of the other interesting issues of the Iran question is once the deal was made um, and the decision is made to lift sanctions, then that becomes a a political problem for the sanctioning state, right? Because are we we're, we're we're offering the rewards too big, too fast? We're sending them pallets of cash or whatever it is that we're accused of doing, right? <laughs> yeah, and and that can get. You know, that can play into the domestic politics of the the country. You know, the pallets of cash were were Iranian assets we'd frozen. We weren't giving Iran money. We were releasing money we'd held on to for you know for thirty thirty years um, that had been that that had been their regimes. But one of the methods of sanctions you want to set up a set of incentives so that people are doing the right thing and they're. Uh, are within, say, the Iranian sanction um, agreement or the the nuclear deal, sort of snapback sanctions. If the Iranians didn't hit certain targets at certain points, sanctions would come back into um, effect. So there was a way of calibrating metrics to achieve progress. It could also build trust that the Iranians don't want to thoroughly denuclearize or stop their advances if all of a sudden, um, you know, uh, uh, the promise is only at the end. They can go little bits of the way and build trust that if they keep going, then more will be forthcoming. And you could get to an agreement at the end that if you were aiming for a big bang agreement, you never would have got because there wasn't enough trust for massive release from sanctions because of the risks you articulated, and at the same time, the risk that shutting down a nuclear, you know, a nascent nuclear program also would take a great deal to start up again. So both sides can make incremental steps and get to a better outcome that way. And uh, so then I I have to ask the the gloomy question, and that is, can you think of an example where uh, the application of economic sanctions uh, had the opposite effect, or let's say had a negative effect rather than the, than the one that may have been in, uh, envisioned by the imposer of sanctions? Well, I think the most prominent um, um, example is the ja- Japanese in 1941. They uh, were engaged in a war of aggression in China, had been for many years. The United States didn't like this, sought to pressure them, um, kept ramping up the sanctions. The J- Japanese expanded their war into French into China. And the U.S. decided that they would embargo oil, um, but even more so, it is the Japanese had built a war chest, um, a lot of gold and a lot of U.S. a lot of U.S. dollars in the United States, and they had licenses for enough oil to get them through 1943. But when the U.S. froze all their assets um, in the U.S., Japan had no way of paying for the oil they had licenses for. The U.S. And in fact, the U.S. never returned the money they froze. Um, so even if the Japanese had wanted to get oil from, say, South America or elsewhere, someone willing to sell, they didn't have the money because the U.S. had frozen it because it was in U.S.-linked institutions in the United States. And the Japanese couldn't couldn't get at it. Um, and, the, and the Japanese had a, you know, they had a great deal of gold. In fact, they continued mining gold in the war. They ended World War II with twice as much gold reserves as they started it with. But the freezing of their financial assets gave them a choice. They couldn't fund their, they couldn't get the raw materials for their war machine. Um, so they would have to either stop their aggression, which they were loath to do. They would have to um, accept a huge amount of impoverishment if they kept going forward. Um, or they would have to accept um, subservience to the United States that this weapon would be something the U.S. could always use. And, um, or they could launch a further war of aggression, try and seize the resources that they required the oil of the Dutch East Indies, uh, and that's what they chose. That the you know they were not going to accept becoming a you know a de facto colony or vassal of the United States. They saw how that had worked for other countries um, with the Europeans. That wasn't what they wanted, so they they lashed out at Pearl Harbor and um, the the British and Dutch possessions and launched um, a, a war that the United States had been you know seeking not to mm-hmm. not to have. Right. So instead of instead of sanctions. Uh, being a replacement for war, they became sort of an overture to war or a prelude to war. Yeah. That's right. And the Japanese um, were pretty good that, that to the United States that they saw the freezing of their financial assets, the cutting off of oil, the diplomatic endeavors that got the British and the Dutch 
to agree as well. Um, and the British and Dutch were very much reliant on U.S. support for their war against the Germans, so they went went along, and they it uh, put the Japanese in a tricky spot. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's let's move to the to current day. So we think about these historical examples, and they'll be sort of looming in the background of this discussion. Um, what, if anything, about the current uh, push for sanctions on Russia has surprised you? Well, I, I was surprised at how draconian and extensive they were, especially in the lead into the crisis. But part of that surprise, I think, is the surprise that most everyone in the West had about the extent of Vladimir Putin's aggression against Ukraine. I think the what what was put up ahead of time, the sanctions he would face, seemed to be predicated around um, the Russians seizing the remainder of these separatist regions, that there was going to be a price for that. Maybe it would include Nord Stream 2. It certainly would include a, a you know, variety of other financial sanctions. And the fact that Putin went not simply with, uh, oh, these are Russian republics that should be autonomous or, or, or their own people's republics, but went with Ukraine is not a country. They're part of Russia. They're a bunch of neat. We're going to extinguish them as a, a country. That was so much beyond what had been expected and anticipated that the sanctions on offer then had to be upped to match it. So you had the total freezing of assets, cancelization of Nord Stream 2, blocking from SWIFT, um, all of the, you know, the, the, now the pullback of, of companies, the massive sanctioning of oligarchs, um, um, the grabbing of yachts, all the, the things to warm one's heart. <laughs> Well, and, 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 but I guess that's the, that's the question. So that they, they were, the sanctions became much more intense than people might've expected. The unity of the sanctions, uh, the, the sanctioners has also been pretty impressive that the United States has been able to, to create such a broad international coalition and hold it together, right? They, obviously without, the, there are, with notable exceptions, right? Not the Chinese and, yeah, uh, the and Indian. or the Indians, but certainly the, the Europeans and the, and, and the North Americans are together on this. Um, and that's kind of surprising, but that raises then the question as we were talking about before is um, at what point should, and should is always a dangerous word, but at what point should um, the imposers of economic sanctions articulate what it's going to take to get the sanctions lifted? Or is talking about lifting the sanctions, essentially, do you run the risk of, of, of destroying your own unity because you're already talking about how you're going to end it? Uh, yeah, no, that, I think that's, that's correct. Um, you you want to be able to say why you're doing this. Well, we know why, but then what's the potential off-ramp? That depends upon what the objective of our policy is. I think um, Dan Dresner recently quite clearly articulated this in the article in the Washington Post. You know, so what are we trying to do? Are we trying to coerce Russia into pulling back to its start lines, in which case it would be, well, these sanctions will largely be rolled back. If you cease your aggression, go back to the status quo ante. That's one option. But if, on the other hand, we decide Vladimir Putin and his regime are bad actors, doesn't matter if they go back, we're in this for the long haul, then we're in an issue of containment. We want to, however this pans out, deprive that regime of resources, raise their costs of operating. Um, we're not going to be unfreezing their assets as long as a regime of this nature remains in power, we're, and this is going to go on for some time. Now, that seems to probably be about where we are, but you can see if that's the case, that you know, if the if the blinders are off the eyes of the West or the Meta West, that um, and they've realized how deep a threat Vladimir Putin is to international stability, it doesn't matter what happens to Ukraine. We know he's a bad character, but if you're President Zelensky, you you know, this broader issue you'll deal with later. You want him out of your country. And if the West isn't giving Putin an off-ramp, oddly, then Putin has every reason to keep trying to gobble you up. And that puts some, you know, our, our containment strategy, which might be a very good strategy for the long term against someone who's as reckless and aggressive as Vladimir Putin, is not necessarily in the immediate interests of the country of Ukraine. That's an awkward, again, an awkward circumstance to be in. Although, and, and especially since one of the reasons I think that in part, not only the massive aggression of Vladimir Putin, but part of the reason we're in 
the circumstance today is that um, President Zelensky has proven to be much more charismatic and uh, brave than people had thought this, you know, comedian um, would be. You know, our, our intel was very good about what was going to happen with the, the Russians attacking, but and so a great success. But there was also accompanied by a big intel failure that our intelligence agencies thought the Ukrainians would fold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we were offering Zelensky a ride out and, you know, his courage and, um, you know, deep-rooted you know, nationalism of the Ukrainian people is one that we underestimated. And I think, you know, we talk about Vladimir Putin underestimating the Ukrainians. We did as well. Uh, but the flip side of it is, having realized that the West has come very much to the support of the Ukrainians, whereas obviously Vladimir Putin has, has doubled down right, and not realized right. that that's a big impediment to his, you know, his ambitions. Well, and, and this gets to the, the problem of, of how, do, how do sanctions land, how are they understood, right? Vladimir Putin has denounced these sanctions as economic war. And it certainly has been true, not just in the Ukraine, in, in this Ukraine war, but also in previous conflicts as well, that there's a tendency among countries in the West who don't want to have to get involved militarily in a problem mm -hmm. to rush to sanctions, as though it's very easy to say, we're going to, you know, Yes, we don't like this, but we're not going to get involved militarily. Sanctions will do the job. But what if Putin is serious about thinking of sanctions as economic warfare? Um, at what point does that dividing line between sanctions and military action get eroded? Yeah, that's an important one. And, and part of the reason that it's often very rare to freeze a country's assets is that sort of tantamount to theft. You know, we didn't yeah. give Iranian reserves back for over 30 years. Um, the Iranians got these reserves as the Russians obtained theirs by running trade surpluses. They bought um, what they thought were readily disposable assets in the West that they could, could repatriate if they needed to. And then lo and behold, we've frozen them. Um, they can't uh, get at them. So the that that's a that it's not simply that we're not trading with them and saying oh you're a bad person we won't trade with you they're actually holding on to the assets and it's as if the you know the Russian they 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 would be tantamount to theft is what they would would say of course we would say well we'll give them back to you but you know what what do property rights mean if someone else can uh, alienate you from them unless you do what they they want that would be part of the 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 concern which is why. You know, it makes it very serious. We've elevated this to such a level. But then the threat to the international order is quite extraordinary. So, you know, it, it's put us into extraordinary um, circumstances, but it does start running those those risks. At the same time, how much of this will deter or, you know, nobble the Russians from being able to pursue their activities? possibly a great deal because of what they rely upon from the West in terms of high technology. So the, the they're getting some solution is probably in Vladimir Putin's interests at some point in time, although a solution for him obviously would entail some subordination of Ukraine and, fi and finding an off-ramp for himself. Right. Well, and 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 that's the you know the idea at some point. You know, the, the the that is the the that phrase does a lot of heavy lifting there, right? It's trying yeah. to figure out you know, when does when do we reach that point, right? When do we understand when sanctions have done enough? And what kind of uh, I'm also wondering, you know, in what ways can sanctions create uh, sort of permanent alterations of uh, international economic relations, right? So say if the Russians, for example, are developing new ways of working through banks or credit cards through the Chinese, right? Will that mean that, you know, there's no guarantee they have to go back to the way things were before, even after sanctions are lifted, correct? Yeah, that's right. So they, they're blocked now pretty much from Visa and MasterCard and from SWIFT. The Chinese have been developing a uh, payments system and that's something the Russians could increasingly use. The issue, though, would be how you know how widespread would that be uh, available to them, and what where could they where could they use it? Um, Mastercard and Visa are extremely widespread. They have huge advantages, and Russia is a really a pretty small economy. And now with lots of travel bans, the countries the Russians like to travel to, which are in Western Europe and the United States. Uh, are not available to them. 
um, even if they did accept, which is frequently not the case, using a um, you know Chinese um, system. So it might be useful for perhaps um, some some of the bilateral trade. But again, Russia's a, a very small economy in the scheme of things. So you know it's about the size of Italy or Australia. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a historian. You are a political scientist. We both have opinions about how well one can predict the future. So I'm not going to ask you to predict the future, but I am going to ask you, um, what is what are the what sorts of things, what sort of 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 outcomes are likely from uh, economic sanctions of this intensity, and certainly in, in a crisis of this intensity? How do you, how does one get back to anything approaching the pre-war normal? I, as long as the Putin regime remains in power, I don't think you're going to get back to anything approaching normal um, from our point of view. I think um, we'll have to look then at what the effect of the sanctions are on us, and mm-hmm. that would be and the Europeans. The U.S. had a very easy job of it because we don't trade much with, with uh, Russia, whereas the Europeans have very big gas and uh, uh, oil Contact so sanction, direct sanctioning by the Europeans of Russian gas and oil is perhaps more costly to them. They have to think about how to to target it. So the long term shift, I think, is a decoupling of the Western economies from Russia. And this is a, a sharp break that we have now. But I think the uh, Western countries are realizing these are not people you want to get enmeshed in. One of the sort of broader political science theories, but it also had historical and Philosophical resonance was about you know, interdependence, or you know, Manuel Kant's, you know, commerce is a great facilitator of peace. It was felt that well, the more you trade with people, this will you know give you interest in not having conflict with them. War is bad for business, and and that, that was quite true. That um, uh, um, but it also gives someone who's willing to act aggressively, as Putin was, a bit of cover because the people in the West would be losing business. It's like the reverse edge of the interdependence sword. It's very much like Norman Angle, who um, uh, famously um, argued that war was just so destructive that people wouldn't in- engage in it. And, and he, was, he, was, he was right that war was incredibly destructive, but some people who are willing to threaten it were willing to exploit that against the people who realized very much what Norman Angle was saying, and you ended up in circumstances that you know were were not what you know you you, you wanted. You'd, you'd allowed aggressors to have more of a free a free reign, right. and I think that's one thing we'll be seeing that this reassessment of globalization that we want to be careful about who our partners are, because if we get entwined with people who have aggressive territorial ambitions like Vladimir Putin, then we're going. You know, do we want to have a large amount of money, jobs exposed to having um, conflict with him? I am thinking the way you're describing that, right, that that uh, if interdependence can work both ways can sometimes be a problem. Uh, if you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares into you. Um, and uh, and so if you are, you know, if, if my economic interests are supposed to bind you, um, they might bind me too. So maybe I should think harder about the about previous sort of simple beliefs that well you know business will make everybody will make everybody friendly. I, the Norman Angel's book, The Great Illusion, right, comes out around 1911, I believe. That's um, right. Which uh, and we all know that everything was great for the next three years until until the Europeans decided to kill nine and a half million of themselves uh, in the in in a war that destroyed the European economy. So uh, economics, we like to believe that it has some kind of uh, of rationalizing power over us. But uh, I guess we should never underestimate the um, irrationality, or let's say, never underestimate the other things that can motivate human beings to do violent things. That, that's right. And, and in fact, you you see some elements of it in terms of the Ukrainian resistance. The other big theme is of historical trends that you see is nationalism, mm-hmm. that um, Vladimir Putin sees nationalism in a way that for the Ukrainians, it's just a, it's a fictional thing. There's no such thing as Ukrainian nationalism. It's um, just a, imaginary. And in a sense, he's, he's right, you know, but Ukrainian nationalism's no more imaginary than Russian nationalism or German nationalism or Palestinian nationalism or, or Spanish nationalism. They're all 
you know, uh, uh, community groups or identities. And one way that can really bind a nation together is having, or a group together, is having a common enemy that seeks to oppress them. So uh, uh, perhaps ironically, in his pursuit of a Russian nationalist agenda, Vladimir Putin has done more for Ukrainian nationalism than um, anyone in, in 70 years. That's a fascinating point. And one can argue he's done more for European integration, too. I'm sending in my nomination for him for the Charlemagne Prize for 2022. <laughs> but uh, uh, Mark Deckenfeld, this has been a great conversation. I guess we're going to have to see how things go, but we appreciate you helping us to think about economic sanctions. We're, we're delighted that you're able to join us on our better peace, and we hope we can get you to come back again soon. Thanks a lot. Well, Thank you very much, Ron. It's a pleasure. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and uh, send us your suggestions for future programs. Please subscribe to A Better Peace if you have not already. And frankly, if you haven't subscribed to A Better Peace yet, um, I really do think you need to take a long look in the mirror um, if you're listening, if you've listened this far. But we do hope you'll subscribe to A Better Peace. And once you've subscribed, that you will rate and review this podcast on your podcatcher of choice, because that is the best way for other people to find out about us. We're always interested in broadening the community for conversations just like this one. And we look forward to welcoming you to our next conversation. And so until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.